So the title of my talk today is Engaging Two Ideas that up until this point in architecture have sort of remained separate. This idea of a religious domain within the architecture and a political domain. And one of the aims of my talk today is to do a lot more dismantling than um, building. And so I hope that I don't destabilize too many of your assumptions <laughs> about Islamic architecture. Although, of course, secretly I hope I destabilize as many as possible. <laughs> but I'd like to give a little bit of background to this talk because this project has a very long history. Um, and it really ties into research that I did several years ago. So I'll be taking you first for a very brief stop in Mamluk Cairo, and then we'll be whizzing back to the seventh century together. So what I'll be exploring today is this idea of the place of the caliph. And the intuitive answer to that is the place of the caliph is everywhere, in the sense that his authority is manifested in several domains. However, the conventional understanding is that the place of the caliph is in his palace, is in the place where he manifests his authority. So one of the first ideas I'd like to challenge is that it is extremely problematic to think of the manifestation of caliphal authority exclusively within a political uh, domain as expressed architecturally through the architecture of the palace. What you're looking at here is a reconstruction of a, a, a mysterious kind of structure in the citadel of Cairo, known as an Iwan al-Kabir. It was an interesting ceremonial configuration that occurred almost out of a void under the Sultan al nasir Muhammad ibn Qalawun. He rebuilt parts of the congregational mosque, and he, re, and he built an open pavilion-like structure, topping it with a green dome. Now, scholars looking at the early sources were confused by references to this dome. It was referred to sometimes as the Green Dome in Arabic, Al-Qubba Al-Khadra, or the Dome of the Green, Qubba Al-Khadra. So just dropping the article completely changes the meaning. And so scholars have argued, what was with the Green Dome? This was probably one of the most monumental structures in the city. It would have been visible from many locations in the city. It was the royal audience hall of the ruler, and he topped it with a green dome. Now, recent excavations have revealed that, in fact, the dome was green. They found green finance tiles in the, in the excavation pit. And so a question emerged immediately as a consequence of this exploration. Where was this idea of the green dome coming from? Why was it associated with the authority of the sultan in Mamluk Cairo? And the only parallel that I could find went all the way back to the Umayyad period. And so this is what triggered my interest. If the Qubba al Khadra, if the idea of this, this potent idea coming from the Umayyad period came out of the context of the Umayyad urban palace, where was the Umayyad urban palace? That was the big question. But another interesting feature about this palace, again, this is a reconstruction um, that I did in collaboration with a graphic designer. So we worked from the primary sources. We were able to reconstruct parts of this palace. The most striking thing, and this is something I only discovered when I put all of the information together from the sources, is that it was a copy of a, a mosque boksura. So this domed space in front of the Qibla, complete with a mimbar and a mihrab. What the Sultan here was trying to recreate was the space of a mosque constructed as a palace. And again, the only parallel I could find from the early sources was a reference from al-Mas'udi describing the relationship between mosque and palace under the Umayyad Caliph Muawiyah. So this triggered a serious research question for me. What was happening in the Umayyad period that was so potent to have survived up until the Mamluk period. Not only survived, but celebrated with a degree of monumentality that really can be only appreciated by exploring, again, from this model. It allowed me to appreciate how important these Umayyad revivalist ideas were. And so I insisted on spending the next seven years of my life figuring it out. 
our first um, example of a Qubbat al-Khadra, and I'm going to come back to the meaning of that in a moment, is in the palace of the Caliph Muawiyah in Damascus. And what I'm showing you here is a reconstruction by Professor Al-Sayyad, who I have to thank for um, providing a visual of this palace, because when I was exploring these ideas, this very important palace had disappeared completely from um, the conception of Islamic art historians. It had disappeared. It was the first monument in Islamic architecture. This predates the Dome of the Rock. This predates the Great Mosque of Damascus. And it was invisible. Invisible like the palace that I had tried to reconstruct. And so I had this frustration with important buildings that had been wiped from our memory simply because we couldn't see them. They were hidden in the sources, and it was very important to bring this knowledge to the foreground, at least for me as an architect, who um, I'm troubled by the disappearance of, of these ideas about buildings, really. So what you're looking at here is a reconstruction of the Great Mosque of Damascus that shows the relationship of the Khadra Palace to the mosque. And I'm going to come back to the significance of this in a moment. But I just wanted to show you this very basic relationship between mosque and palace. And in a sense, this is where the idea of the dichotomy between the religious and the political comes from. There is a mosque, and that is the domain of the religious authority, and there is a palace, and that's the domain of the political authority. But when we look at the sources, what becomes apparent very quickly is that the caliph used these spaces interchangeably. He would spend time in his palace performing probably purely secular political functions, like meeting with ambassadors, so on and so forth. But then he would move several times a day back and forth between the palace and the mosque, sit in front of the Qibla wall of the mosque, and use the mosque space as a courthouse. Allow the faithful to come and meet him in person and bring their cases before him. And so if you remember the um, reconstruction I showed you earlier, that's what was happening with the Mamluk Sultan. That's exactly what he was doing. He was recreating a space that was mosque-like. He would sit on a chair, and this time the Qadi, the Mamluk judge, would sit on the mimbar. But under Muawiyah, he was both judge and caliph and imam. So he would lead his community in prayer, and then he would sit on one chair and act as judge, and then he would move to the mimbar and preach a sermon. And so what emerged immediately was that Building types are a very problematic concept because they imprison all of the richness of human behavior. And so I tried to allow concepts to bleed, to move between contained spaces into entire geographies. And so that was the aim of the project. But there's a major problem. There's almost no supporting archaeology for the architecture of the Umayyads within their cities. This is further complicated by the fact that we have so much information from their desert palaces that it has confused the issue. The authority of the Umayyad caliphs within their palaces is about the palaces they built out in the desert. And I would not deny the significance of these palaces. But first of all, they are all later. By the time these palaces appear, Muawiyah, Abd al-Malik, and his son in Walid had been in power for decades. This was the time when the caliphate was forged. It's very difficult to accept that the architecture did not play a role in this formative period. And so a model was adopted to allow for the emergence of patterns of activity from the sources that would help me explore relationships in the buildings without necessarily having the archaeological remains. So I know that there is some progress with the excavation of Al-Khadr Palace in Damascus. However, the results haven't been published. They're unlikely to be published anytime soon in light of the current situation. But just to reinforce the significance of this idea of the Khadr Palace, in the primary sources, this palace of Muawiyah is compared with monumental structures such as the Iwan of Kisra. So this was a monument, the significance of which we can't deny. It was a large, ornate, monumental structure that would have dominated the city. And it was 
rebuilt, uh, it was a rebuilt structure. An, an earlier Byzantine palace had been on the site and Muawiyah rebuilt the structure, supposedly as part of his psychological warfare against the Byzantines. And just to give you a sense of this idea of the Qubbat al-Khadra, and this is where I'd like to give you a little bit of background, almost every single important caliph constructed a Qubbat al-Khadra, or a Dome of the Green. Al-Hajjaj constructs one in Wasit, following on from the Damascus Palace of, of Muawiyah, and Abd al-Malik, um, excuse me, uh, Al-Walid, uh, hang on a second, there's a... Not Rusafa. There was a Qubat al Hadra constructed in Rusafa under the Caliph al Hisham. And I think that there may be an error there. My apologies. But the case that I'm trying to make here is that these structures were being constructed exclusively associated with caliphal authority. But what was the Dome of the Green? What was the Qubat al-Khadra? I don't have time to get into all of the interpretations. However, the latest consensus in the discipline is that it was associated with a representation of the Dome of Heaven. So the Khadra, in this sense, was supposed to evoke the color of the night sky. And so the Caliph presumably um, was evoking this celestial association in his palace. But early Islamic authority as an idea also presents us with a series of challenges. I began by saying that the approach mobilized this reconstruction of an entire culture of authority in early Islam. However, the problems that emerge very quickly are that the series of succession crises and civil wars meant that there was no clear um, trajectory for the Umayyads to follow. So on one hand, they were facing serious opposition. However, the most serious challenge to their authority was the fact that nowhere in the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad or in the Quran is there a clear-cut definition of what the caliphate actually is. And that's something that I'd like you to really reflect on. Following the death of the Prophet Muhammad, there was no clear idea of what a caliph was. The Quran doesn't necessarily help us. There was a huge amount of debate in these sources regarding the meaning of Khalifa. Even the title of the ruler, Amir al-Mu'minin, which was um, used contemporary with the title of Khalifat, uh, Khalifat Allah or Khalifat Rasulullah in an earlier incarnation, the relationship between these two was uncomfortable. And so, to kind of summarize here, the office of the ruler of the Muslim community was a vaguely, ambiguously defined concept. Was he God's successor, God's Khalifa? Was he the successor of the Prophet? Or was he only the commander of the faithful? By the end of the Umayyad period, this issue was resolved conclusively. The last Umayyad caliphs, rule confidently as Khalifat Allah, carrying the parallel title of Amir al-Mu'mineen or Commander of the Faithful. And all of this uncertainty about the nature of the Caliphate is resolved. This did not happen by itself. It happened as part of a concerted, persistent effort on the part of the Umayyads to create what I refer to as a culture of legitimacy. Throughout their culture, they imbued narratives of um, legitimacy, creating, forging strong links between themselves and <clears throat> entities that could legitimately endow them with some kind of divine right to rule. So I'll give you a couple of examples just to illustrate this point about the culture, and then we'll move into the architecture. Because what the study tried to do was to create the culture by convincing our audience that w there was such a thing as a culture of legitimacy. And then within this culture, try to position the role of the architecture. And the assumption, of course, is that the architecture may be mobilizing themes and concepts that had been established throughout the culture. And that's precisely what we found. <clears throat> 
There were two arenas where the Omeyyads relentlessly pursued this agenda. One of them was poetry, and some of you may be familiar with this, and the other was the experimentation in imagery on coins. The Caliph Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan resurrected a type of panegyric ode that allowed him to mobilize all of the munificence of the pre-Islamic ruler while aligning himself closely with the Islamic version of the rightful ruler. This was important because the Umayyads could not, like their rivals the Byzantines, assume the position of emperor. They actively shunned the idea of themselves as kings but they did not want to be princes either. They had to be something else. And the designation that was chosen was that of Khalifa. But Khalifa to whom? The Prophet or to Allah himself? And what they pushed for and eventually achieved was establishing throughout the culture a close and firm association that they were directly given the right to rule from the divine source itself. So I've sort of given the game away a little bit, but this was my orientation in terms of the thinking because this is what the poetry was saying and this is what the coinage was saying. There was a persistent drive to create a direct link, crucially bypassing the prophet Muhammad because of the schisms that some of you may be aware of um, within the community, um, the, the Umayyad rivals were basically the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. So it was necessary for them, for their legitimizing efforts, to create a much more direct link. And what we're going to see today is how the architecture, through um, the medium of um, imagery and associations, was able to do this. So a very quick example from the coinage, just to illustrate this point about experimentation with imagery. You're looking at a coin known as the Standing Caliph coin. And on one side, there's the image of the caliph with the Muslim proclamation of the faith around the edge. And he is standing with his sword, more importantly, without a crown, which is something that the sources um, noted um, repeatedly that, for example, the caliph Muawiyah ascended the throne and did not wear a crown. And so there was a, this again is an example of their shunning of uh, the, these kingly prerogatives. But what's even more interesting is what's on the other side of the coin. This is known as a transformed cross on steps. It follows on from the model of a pre-Islamic Byzantine coin. So what would have been on this coin in the Byzantine era would have been a cross on steps. However, under Abdel Malik, it was transformed into a pole. And the interpretation, the numismatic interpretation, is that Abdel Malik was reluctant to radically transform the image of a familiar coin, again, responding to fears that changes in currency could potentially destabilize the economy. So kept an element of familiarity, but obviously uh, could not include the image of the cross. However, he included an image that was extremely potent in the context of his own authority. And that is the image of the pole or the qutb. And we know it was so significant to him because he's referred to con consistently his descendants and his predecessors as being the pole of the faith, the axis around which the community circumambulates. He is the stable um, rod that connects the terrestrial realm with the heavenly realm. And you can go on and on with the various associations. But what's fascinating about this specific image that carries forth from the poetry into the coinage is that we see it being expressed in the architecture over and over again. And for those of you who are thinking of circumambulation, you might be able to guess which building I'm talking about. However, this period of visual experimentation ended very quickly. And what we see is the prototypical Islamic coin with the stark proclamation of the faith, after which images don't appear on coins again almost for, for several centuries following um, Abdel Malik's coinage reform. And so this period of visual experimentation, I've only included one, there were several. This shows us that there was an awareness of the potency of these images. There was a sense that transforming an image into a 
symbol that may potentially serve their own iconographic agenda was something they were pursuing. And so I cite the example of the transformed cross into the Qutb or the pole as a clear example of Umayyad awareness creating this image for themselves through the visual. And they did the same with the poetry. But I've been talking about spaces and locales of authority from the beginning of this lecture. Where was authority manifested in the early Islamic period? If we're going to seriously look at how the Umayyads were able to mobilize some of these ideas, what was happening before the Umayyads took power? So very briefly, I will familiarize you with how the early mosque um, in Medina would have operated. This would have been the residence of the Prophet Muhammad, or this is again a reconstruction. And against the Qibla wall, the Prophet would have stood and preached his message. The space also would have functioned as a courthouse. He would have had a simple mimbar upon which he stood. So the seminal ideas that would later develop into the mosque space started here. There was no mihrab, there was no dome. It was a flat-roofed, simple space with a simple mimbar. And this is an image just to give you a sense of, um, of what these spaces, how they would have operated. Uh, members of the community would have gathered in front of the mimbar, the judge or the caliph or the imam would have stood, and the mimbar would have acted as a pseudo-throne. However, we know the Umayyads were very careful in managing their furniture within the mosque. So the kind of chair that Muawiyah would sit on in the palace would not be the same chair he'd sit on in the mosque. There was this mindfulness of not transposing into the mosque space the language of the palace with its secular connotations. Under the Caliph al-Walid I, this relationship becomes articulated in a truly monumental style. So this is a, another reconstruction of the relationship between the Khadrat Palace and the mosque, Great Mosque of Damascus. This would have been the Qibla space, and together this space and the palace would have operated as one unit. Al-Walid would have used the space in a manner very similar to his predecessor, Muawiyah, using the mosque space as an audience hall and the palace as an audience hall. So in terms of um, where the authority of the caliph manifested, it was manifesting in a gray area between mosque and palace. So if we want to really draw a line around the domain of the caliph, it's happening somewhere here between two building types. However, this was probably not the most potent representation of the authority of the caliph. Because a crucial qualifier for the legitimacy of a ruling caliph was the ability to secure the bay'ah, or the oath of allegiance from his community. And, it, and a crucial aspect of the securing of this oath and this carries on from a pre-Islamic precedent, is that this oath needed to be carried out in a special kind of site. In the pre-Islamic period, these oaths of allegiance among Quraysh, uh, the pre-Islamic, I'm sure you're all familiar with Quraysh, um, would have, these oaths of allegiance would have occurred at the Haram in Mecca. And the idea, simply put, is that for the oath to have the a power of law, it needed to be carried out within, under the auspices of the divine. So in the case of the pre-Islamic sanctuary at the Kaaba, it would have been the pre-Islamic deities. However, on, during the Islamic period, the bay'ah for Muhammad, for example, after entering Mecca, occurred within this space. Under the Umayyads, however, the bay'ah of Muawiyah occurred in Jerusalem. And that's something that we really need to pause and think about. Because now we're not just talking about spaces where authority is being manif manifested. We're really thinking in a terms of a sacred geography. And for the Umayyads to try to reconfigure their sacred geography in that sense is quite a crucial turning point in this dynamic. But it makes sense. Muawiyah's power base was in that geographical area on the one hand, and he was involved in a serious um, uh, conflict with uh, 
the people of Mecca and Medina at this point. So logistically, it wouldn't have been possible for him to secure the oath among his enemies. But the next best place was Jerusalem. This is before the construction of the Dome of the Rock, just so that um, to kind of keep your chronology on track. And so, in a sense, the Umayyads, even in the earliest, the first act of Muawiyah, is to reconfigure where his authority may be legitimized. And it's happening in Jerusalem. And it's happening somewhere in Jerusalem. We're not exactly sure where. However, there was at some point during this ceremony a visit to the Haram al-Sharif. So I'd like you just to remember that context in a moment because we will be coming back to it. So if we stop for a moment and reflect on where the authority of the Caliph is being enacted. It's being enacted in the mosque, it's being enacted in the palace, and it's being enacted within the Caliph's role as protector of a sacred shrine. And the importance of the control of that sacred shrine was on the one hand to grant his covenant or his pledges of allegiance that binding power, but also to symbolically embody his role as guardian of a situated locale of divine authority. Because really that is what the Kaaba is. The Kaaba was believed in the pre-Islamic period, and this idea carried on into the Islamic period, to be the earthly location of the heavenly throne. There was a direct physical bond between this specific site and the celestial realm. And if you think in terms of the caliph as qutb or pole, around which his community circumambulates, in a harmonious um, life, then the members of the society of the Muslim Ummah circumambulating the shrine were ritually reenacting on some level that relationship. And so this is one example of how these images that started, that, that really have a life in the poetry and perhaps in the coinage, realize their full potential when they took on an architectural expression. So to come back to the idea of Jerusalem, why securing Jerusalem was so important, and all of the events that occurred later in the Haram al-Sharif, securing control of a, an earthly locus for a heavenly domain was a crucial qualifier for authority. So this is just to kind of give you a sense of the geographic scope that we're talking about, and for the, I'm sure you all know the relationships between Mecca, Medina, Damascus, and Jerusalem, but in terms of the kind of north-south tension, this tension between the Umayyad power base in Damascus and Jerusalem, and what would later be um, a Zubayrid power base in Medina and Mecca in the second civil war, this is a tension that kept repeating itself under Muawiyah, under Abd al-Malik, and was only resolved under Abdu'l-Malik's son and Walid I. So I started off by presenting this idea that these locales of authority, their control, and the enactment of certain rituals around them was a crucial qualifier for the authority of a ruling caliph. So for Abdu'l-Malik to construct the Dome of the Rock in this specific location, invite pilgrimage and receive his own bayah or oath of allegiance on this site is something we need to contextualize when we look at the meaning of the Dome of the Rock. And so some of you may be familiar with um, the several competing interpretations regarding the symbolism of the building. But one of the things that I try to introduce in this study is that the Dome of the Rock is a shrine acting in a manner similar to the shrine in Mecca. The oaths of allegiance that would have occurred at the shrine in Mecca are now occurring in Jerusalem. This is a site that is attempting to appropriate the qualities that previously 
had been monopolized in the early Islamic period by Mecca, by the Kaaba in Mecca. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the building, the Dome of the Rock is a dome over a rock. Um, uh, I'm fondly known in Cambridge as the young woman who is obsessed with the Dome of the Rock, which um, is something that I, with great pride, say I remain obsessed with the Dome of the Rock. Um, but the Dome of the Rock is a structure, regardless of the competing interpretations, was it the site of the ascent of the Prophet Muhammad? Was it a representation of the divine throne on earth? Was it a, um, a recreation of the temple? All of these um, interpretations lead to the same idea. That regardless of what you believe the Dome of the Rock was there to do, what happened at the site tells you the nucleus of what the goal of the building was. The fact that the oaths of allegiance happened on this specific site. The fact that pilgrims were brought in to participate in the activity of upholding Umayyad Caliphal authority is very significant. And in this sense, the Dome of the Rock is the quintessential locale of authority. So if the mosque and palace are embodying this authority spatially, the Dome of the Rock is extending it to a much broader context. It is centering within the Umayyad power base a much more rarefied idea of authority, mainly heavenly um, divine authority. So we're going to come back to the layout in a moment. But I'd like to focus on one element from the mosque space, simply because it encapsulates a process that the Umayyads repeated time and time again when it came to their architecture of authority. Some of you um, may be familiar with the interpretations that challenge the idea that a mihrab is a niche. For those of you who aren't familiar with these ideas, the mihrab is not a niche. So um, that's the first kind of um, destabilizing I'd like to do today. According to architectural historians, the first mihrab in Islamic architecture was a niche in the wall of the mosque of Al Walid I, a reconstruction of the Prophet's mosque of Al Walid I in Medina. Al Walid embarked on an ambitious building program and stamped upon a group of mosques in Damascus, Jerusalem, Medina, Samarkand, Sana'a, and Fustat, the same architectural ensemble. A niche in the wall, a dome above the Qibla, and of course the mimbar and the maksura had already been part of this ensemble. So when we need added to the Qibla space two additional elements. Now this makes sense within the context of how the mosque was operating. It was operating as a space where the caliph expressed his religious and political authority, so it would make sense to make the space a bit more monumental. However, the order of introducing these elements reveals a certain intent. El Walid first introduced these elements in the Mosque of the Prophet in Medina and refurbished the entire mosque. This is a reconstruction because obviously it's been um, it's been rebuilt several times, and he used the same motifs of decoration in all of his mosques. The same gold mosaics, the same kinds of Quranic inscriptions in all of his mosques. So this has been interpreted as Al-Walid's attempt to stamp upon the, the mosques of the major provinces his image of caliphal authority. So to sum up, Al-Walid was embarking on this mission to place himself as caliph visually at least, within all of the Qibla spaces of the major mosques. But the introduction of the niche and the dome, first at the mosque of the Prophet in Medina, suggests that what he may have been attempting to do was to associate these specific elements with the place of the Prophet Muhammad. Because the sources discuss this connection, that the niche is there to symbolize where the Prophet stood 
and the dome was there to mark his physical presence. But there is a problem with this idea. And the central problem is that there is no archaeological evidence before these niches appear in the Mosque of Al-Walid. So they also occur in the Great Mosque of Damascus. These are examples of the mosaics from the Great Mosque of Damascus. There is absolutely no evidence that in any mosque that predates Al-Walid that there were any niches in walls. So if a mihrab is a niche in a wall, there were no mihrabs that predated the reign of Al-Walid I. However, examining the sources will show you that there are multiple references to mihrabs that predate the mihrabs of Al-Walid. Not only that, but the context of the discussion suggests that they weren't niches at all. They were actually spaces. Spaces in which people entered and exited, spaces surrounded by gilded columns, so on and so forth. And so the idea that the mihrab was a niche in a wall was dismantled. So what was a mihrab? And why did Al-Walid attempt to monopolize on the idea of the mihrab with his niche? This is a cross-section of the Great Mosque of Damascus. Uh, the dome is reconstructed, but in terms of the, the proportions, it's likely that it would have been very similar. A similar structure was also erected in Al-Walid's Mosque in Jerusalem, uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, on the Haram al-Sharif. I won't have time to get into the numismatic evidence about the, the discussion of whether mihrabs predated Al-Walid from the numismatic evidence because it has been... Um, refuted. So I'm going to move on from that for now. But to come back to this idea that a mihrab is not a niche, mihrab is a space, scholars examined the context of the mihrab idea in pre-Islam. And what they concluded was that it was an idea that encompassed many types of spaces. So it is described here as the sadr or the central most part of the house, the most honored location. And that's why the mihrab of the mosque was named thus. The mihrab is also the ghurfa, or the chamber, from the expression, the maharib of Ghundan. And what's being referenced here is a pre-Islamic palace in Yemen that had this iconic status in the pre-Islamic and early Islamic imagination. But also mihrabs are, are referred to as spaces that were potentially elevated, as you can see from this um, verse of poetry. Uh, where um, I guess a suitor cannot reach his beloved without ascending a staircase. But the mihrabs in the early sources were also associated with the spaces within synagogues, the front part of the synagogue, which would have been imbued with a certain degree of sacrality. So what emerges is that the mihrab is a space that is identified with multiple functions. And it's described here, and I quote, as a signifier of abstract superlative qualities. It reflects formal and functional identities of its associates without itself changing value. This mechanism expands the term's interpretive qualities indefinitely and accounts for its multiple meanings. It can be understood as palace or temple, as in the case of Rumden, and the synagogue, as throne niche or oratory, a seat of honor, or the maqam of the imam, or the place of the imam. And so, in terms of the mihrab idea, the fact that all of the qualities, all of these qualities, associations with royal authority, associations with sacrality, are being appropriated to describe the space in front of the qibla in which the caliph sat is highly relevant. But I left out a crucial piece of the evidence. And this um, kind of represents my contribution to the discussion of the mihrab. And that's mainly a pattern that I noted when I superimposed upon this Umayyad culture of legitimacy every instance in the Quran where the mihrab was discussed. And what merged was the following. The mihrab is discussed in 
two types of contexts. The first, the mihrab of Mary and Zakaria. Um, the Quran discusses both figures or, or both um, individuals being somehow granted a divine blessing. In the case of Mary, um, the Quran discusses how every time anyone would visit her in the mihrab, they would find that she had blessings. In the case of Zakaria, upon his prayer in the mihrab, he receives a divine communion that if he performs a certain act, he will um, be granted a son. And so within these spaces, some kind of divine communion is occurring. So that was one commonality. However, the more interesting commonality for my purposes was the association of Maharib with the kingship of David and Solomon. And so this verse talks about the construction of Maharib as one of the prerogatives of mulk, of rulership, of sovereignty. Now, David and Solomon are, just, are not just any prophets in the Quran. They are the prophets that are granted the divine right to rule, and most conveniently for the Umayyads, they're granted in the Qur'an what I like to refer to as the divine right to build, as patrons of monuments. And this is significant. But it's really the third category, which is a standalone category, that is, that is truly um, an eye-opening um, window into the idea of the mihrab in relation to caliphal authority. And that is this. <coughs> the third time, or the, the, in this case, the fourth time that the mihrab is discussed in the Quran, it's discussed in a very specific context. It is discussed in the context of an incident in the life of the Prophet David, where he is granted the divine right to rule by judging fairly. So he errs in his judgment, repents, and following his repentance, and the assumption is his commitment to act as a just ruler. We have made thee a prophet and thus our Khalifa on earth. This is extremely important when we remember that this is the only time outside of the Khilafa of the prophet Adam that the endowment of the Khilafa is associated with a space. And that space is none other than the mihrab. And so from there, um, this allowed me to prepare the conceptual context to argue for a cumulative force of this mihrab concept. Not only was it coming with so many associations from pre-Islam, it had an explicit special reference in the Quran, a reference to the divine right to rule a right the Umayyads were desperate to secure. So I will not push the interpretation further than that at this point. However, this does inform um, the rest of my work in terms of the, uh, in terms of the study. And this is the, the, the context of the verse for those of you who might be interested. So this is where the uh, discussion of the mihrab occurs. Considering the context of the endowment of the divine right to rule, of the Khilafa, the context of Davidic justice, the mihrab allows us to begin to think about the architectural version of the Umayyad culture of legitimacy. And so if the panegyric ode served the literary function of situating the caliph within a long line of rightful rulers, the mihrab or the mobilizing of the mihrab concept with all of its richness was potentially serving the same purpose. Its special mentioning in the Quran makes this case even more compelling. But there's an added twist because we have evidence that under the uh, Caliph Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, 
a special site next to the Dome of the Rock was constructed. A pavilion, a small pavilion that many people visit the site and never pay attention to, which archaeology has shown is contemporary with the Dome of the Rock. This small pavilion was constructed under the Caliph Abdelmelik ibn Marwan, and in the early sources, and also in the later sources, we know it would have served as an open-air court of justice and was associated with King David or the Prophet David himself. So at this point, the connections in the early sources are very ambiguous, but the, the, the tie that really connects um, the idea of a Mihrab Dawood in the Quran with a site that in the pre-Islamic period was associated with Davidic authority, mainly um, the site of the Haram al-Sharif, and the fact that Abdul Malik consolidated these ideas into an actual space in which he sat and his predecessors sat as judges. And so in a sense, this pavilion gives us a glimpse, um, and it's not possible to conclusively prove that Abdul Malik was necessarily trying to recreate the Mihrab Dawood on this site. But when the connections are put in place, there's, um, th there's enough evidence at least to suggest that this is what was being alluded to. And when you put this within the context of Abdul Malik's strident efforts to associate himself with Davidic justice, this becomes even more clear. So for example, um, one of the famous prophecies of a, um, an Umayyad consultant known as Kaab al-Ahbar, who was a rabbi and converted to Islam, and was responsible for the Islamicization of several um, ideas from pre-Islam, specifically from Jewish culture. One of his prophecies is that was that the rock would be adorned by God's servant Abdul Malik, and that in this sense Abdul Malik had brought full circle the relationship, the divine relationship between the Prophet David as patron of the site and Abdul Malik. And so in a sense, this allows us, in conclusion, to revisit the idea of the mihrab. Was the creation of a pavilion-like space within the mosques of Al-Walid, with the construction of the dome and the um, maintaining of a sequestered space, an attempt to, to mobilize the mihrab concept, ultimately with the aim of anchoring the divine presence in the space of the caliph. And so by mobilizing this idea that the divine right to rule was granted in a mihrab, and the caliph now sits in a mihrab, that connection can be asserted on an architectural level at least, much more strongly. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope I haven't overwhelmed you.